Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Steve Hoffman. I'm with Honeywell. Uh, my role is consulting engineer and end user sales specialist. I'm going to walk you through the Honeywell portfolio of products. Um, some of it in detail, some of it not so much in detail. Um, so here's the agenda. Um, system architecture, um, our webs products, uh, our Niagara products, uh, we call them webs. Uh, field controllers, um, our light commercial uh, connect solution. Um, IP controllers get into that. And then uh, some of our uh, global engineering services, our field devices, um, and then the Honeywell website. So with that, um, uh, here is the, um, I'll call it uh, old uh, system architecture. Um, up on the right-hand side in the, in the right corner here, you uh, can see a server connected to a LAN-WAN connection and um, new on the far left side, the uh, new uh, JACE 8000, Web 8000, as we call it, the old uh, AX JACEs in the middle there. Um, an Eagle product, a plant controller that we have, and we've now updated to the N4 version, and then a uh, security JACE. And then also on the right-hand side is kind of the security architecture, CCTV and uh, card access stuff. So that's kind of the old architecture, and we'll talk about these products and then move into the newer architecture. Um, first, with the uh, master controller, the Web 8000, if someone is uh, uh, familiar with the Niagara framework, and a JACE, uh, obviously that's what this is. Um, uh, some of the highlights about the um, the product portfolio, the web station, the web supervisor is that uh, software that sits on your server, um, browser-based, graphical user interface. Um, that's usually where all uh, end users access their system via username and password. Nothing new if you're familiar with the Niagara framework. Um, and then the controllers, I like to call them master controllers, uh, the JACES, um, compatible with open and legacy protocols. Um, you can install third-party drivers in there. Uh, um, and uh, that, that connects your field controllers, as I like to call them, to the, uh, to the network. Um, uh, like with other JACES, uh, you can add um, I.O. modules to um, to the web's 8000 JACE, um, nothing new there. And uh, like I mentioned, third-party drivers uh, in point number four there, you can add those to our JACE. We have an open NICS statement, meaning that anyone's workbench will work on our web's JACE. Well, the web 8000, uh, some details there. I'm not going to get deep into this stuff. Uh, the typical processor, if you're familiar with JACEs and in, in the RAM that's available, uh, fully encrypted. I think that's one uh, really nice feature about the Niagara framework uh, um, is that uh, when you use Fox S uh, protocol, that is an encrypted protocol. Um, today, LAN, uh, I'm sorry, BACnet IP is not an encrypted protocol. It's kind of a point we like to make. Um, the drivers that are embedded in the JACE there um, uh, include BACnet, Modbus, LAN, SNMP, KNX. Um, the Web 8000 JACE is, uh, can be licensed from five to 200 controllers. It has a Wi-Fi switch on it, so you can make it Wi-Fi if you uh, so desire, and also a micro SD card for backups. Um, makes replacement of a uh, JACE if one were to get water on it or something and fail. Um, pretty easy to swap out a new JACE, pull the micro SD card off the old JACE and put it in the new JACE. And, and you're effectively up and running. Um, the other feature that uh, that we highlight is that last bullet um, under the under the first red bullet about the embedded field controller programming tool. Um, so for our field controllers that I'll get into, um, we like we uh, highlight the fact that we embed the programming tool inside of our web's workbench in the in the JS8000, uh, and we do that so that when a uh, a, a contractor finishes a job and leaves the job site, the uh, tools are all there for uh, for the field devices as well. So no one has to go find a, a laptop and and, uh, and the programming tool that's on that laptop and, and uh, is it up to date, uh, all those kind of issues that sometimes uh, become 
um, a challenge. Uh, the software is right inside the web's workbench. You have the access to it. Um, I've highlighted at the bottom there the old versions, the old hardware, the old AX, uh, Niagara AX hardware, which uh, the web uh, 300E, the web 600E, the web 700, they're obsolete, but we're still supporting them. Um, your friends at Cochrane Supply still support those. And not sure what the end of life for support on those is, um, but it's uh, I, I, I would think it's coming up. So uh, if if an end user has uh, the old AX version, Jace's uh, um, you know conversations uh, with them should take place regarding updating those to the newer hardware and Niagara Four. Uh, a slide I like to show comparing the old uh, AX Jaces to the uh, to the new Jace 8000. Um, in the old days, uh, the challenge was if I had one of those uh, near the bottom of the slide there, the Web uh, 300s, for example, um, and I and I added devices. Uh, back in the day, you had to usually replace hardware as well, so you had to go to, from a Web 300 to a Web 600 if I was adding field controllers. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the 300 might be fine and still fully functional, but it didn't have the capacity, so you had to replace it. And, uh, you know, end users kind of said, well, this is this kind of stinks that I have to upgrade my hardware just because I'm expanding my building. Um, that Those issues have gone away with the uh, with the Jace 8000 that was reduced, released uh, in 2016. Uh, it's simply uh, the hardware remains in place and you just get a, a bigger license. You just add on the license that allows you more devices. Um, so you can order them in, in any of those sizes that are listed, the 200, the 8200, 8100, 8025, et cetera. But then there's also drivers that will add devices to those, but you max out at 200 controllers. That's a lot of controllers. And um, the drivers um, that are included in the 8000 are listed on the bottom there. Um, and as com for comparison in the AX world, it was all a la carte. So the Jace came with no drivers and you added drivers as you needed them. Whereas with the 8000 Jace, all of those drivers uh, that are listed in gray come standard. So uh, the enhancements that, uh, that Tritium and, and Honeywell included with the uh, Jace 8000 are, are pretty nice they did a nice job when they came out with that product um, uh, this is a slide specific to Honeywell um, so that if uh, a contractor does an end user and contractor does get to a point where they want to upgrade some uh, existing AX Jaces to Niagara 4 um, you can actually um, upgrade an AX Jace to Niagara 4, put the Niagara 4 software in it, but you do have limitations and, uh, and a contractor, a Niagara certified contractor um, needs to kind of check these things out before they just try to uh, push Niagara 4 into an AX Jace. The main bullet is that second one that, that the heap space has to be 36 megabytes. And we've also shown a little slide on the side there um, about how many controllers uh, each one of those, uh, how many spider controllers each one of those uh, AX Jaces can uh, can handle in the N4 version. A lot of times people just say, look, you've got old hardware, it's time to upgrade to the new hardware. But in some cases, that's not always possible. So let's talk about field controllers. Uh, the uh, the term we use we we have three uh, really three different types of uh, field controllers we call them spiders and uh, those are the the top row there the gray guys they are fully programmable um, and we have different models of them and I'll get into that we have strikers which is the middle column there the white ones uh, and those are configurable and they have two accessory loops so the gray ones fully programmable effectively a white sheet of paper. I can make it do whatever I want. The strikers, the white ones, uh, configurable, so they they can only be configured, not fully programmable. And then we have a back net thermostat as well, which is configurable as well. A uh, little bit of cost difference between the models. So let's get the spider, the programmable guy. 
uh, fully programmable for any, any application. We have uh, LAN versions and uh, BACnet versions. Uh, part number, I'll tell you what, what, uh, which one it is, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, various I.O. counts. Uh, you have an option for relay digital outputs as opposed to only triax. Um, you can get uh, integrated actuators. You can see the th third one uh, from the left down there has the actuator on it. And you can also get I.O. expansion modules, which is that, uh, that guy on the far right side there. Um, the programmable tools, as I mentioned earlier, are uh, embedded inside our web's workbench. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of this slide. This highlights some of the features of it. Uh, for example, we have a DC power supply on it. So if you have a, a humidity sensor or, or a device like that that needs power, uh, you can power it right off of the spider. Um, you got the actuator, you got uh, uh, pressure uh, sensor built into it on uh, particular models. Um, and uh, uh, we have this uh, lower right hand or lower left hand corner, um, this silk bus. Um, that is a, a Honeywell uh, proprietary thing. It's a two wire polarity insensitive bus that provides both uh, power and communication between our controller and our silk um, devices. So we have some space sensors, some actuators, some, uh, some uh, outside air and return air type sensors that are on the silk bus it saves you io uh, and also usually eliminates wiring mistakes because that uh, is just a two-wire bus um, you can daisy chain it you don't even have to daisy chain it um, and it's polarity insensitive so it's pretty difficult to make a mistake when you wire those things um, color-coded um, inputs and outputs uh, the intent there is to reduce uh, wiring mistakes and those terminal blocks are removable um, each one of our um, um, controllers has a, a universal input that can be used as a uh, pulse uh, it will it will accept pulse counts for meters really um, so we have one on every one of our controllers and there's a little uh, chart. Uh, hopefully, it's not too blurry. But uh, this is our backnet line, um, the PUB and the PVB. So it's just a nice little quick chart um, that's in our documentation that shows uh, um, what the I/O count is and what the specifics about the controller are. And I'll get into that maybe a little bit deeper here with the um, with the naming convention for the controller. The specifics about the backnet, so it's uh, MSTP, um, various baud rates there. It is a, a backnet uh, application specific controller, B ASC certified. Um, it's got the PICS statement. Um, you can put up to, uh, we say, 30 controllers per backnet MSTP LAN segment. Um, and then there, there's the LAN chart. And you'll notice it's basically the same exact thing, but uh, the third character is a L now instead of a B. So unitary is the second character, and then L, LON, or BACnet, um, and then V is the VAV model. So we tried to make the uh, part numbering um, make sense when you look at a controller. Um, the details about the uh, LON controller, 76K. Uh, speed, uh, 200 function blocks per controller. I'm not sure that was listed in the BACnet one, but the BACnet one, I believe, can go to 300 function blocks in your programming tool, 240 network variables, and 120 controllers per LAN network. Um, and then what I did is I broke it down a little bit more. So there's the just the VAV controllers, um, BACnet and LAN. So you got a PVB and you got a PVL. And you notice the, the part numbers are the same, um, except for a few characters. Um, and then, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, four digits after the letters identifies the um, universal ends, digital ends, analog out, digital outs. So if you have a PVV, 
USB 4022AS. You got four universal ins, zero digitals, two analogs, two digital outs. And then because it's a VAV, it's got the, the sensor in it, the uh, airflow pickup sensor. And it has a, um, if it has an A there, it has an actuator as part of it. And then uh, without the actuator, now you got an NS at the end. So N meaning no actuator, A meaning actuator. Unitary controller, same kind of deal. And so this chart showing you the uh, the back end and the line unitaries just on one chart. There's the uh, naming convention. So P meaning programmable. Second character is either unitary or VAV. Third character is either line or backnet. And then there's uh, the the uh, point numbers. So like I mentioned, universal inputs, and then digitals, and then analog, and then digital outs. And then it's either with or without an actuator, A or N. S, uh, all of them now have the S bus. You could have an older version that did not have a, a silk bus, but boy, that would be a pretty old controller. And then if there's an R on the end of the part number, that means it does have relay outputs. If there's no R there, uh, the outputs, the uh, digital outputs are triax. Uh, here's the uh, I.O. modules, the silk I.O. modules. And we tried to keep that same kind of uh, naming convention. So uh, S.I.O. And then uh, there's the three different models, a 6042, a 4022, and then a 12000, meaning you just got 12 universal inputs and no other inputs or outputs. Um, the silk benefits you, the program logic resides in the controller. So they're, uh, you know, some would say they're dumb IO. There's no program inside those IO, but you hook them to the controller via the silk bus. Um, you can, you can, uh, you know, connect them right next to the controller or you can remote mount them, um, away from the controller. We're limited to three on a lawn spider. Uh, only two on a back spider, and that's just because of uh, the uh, the um, processor and uh, the amount of memory that's in there. Uh, Backnet works a little bit different than LAN. Other silk devices, sensors and actuators. So it's something that we try to promote. Um, you see there a, a a space sensor that's silk, and we also have uh, actuators that are silk. Um, yeah, um, yeah. there's a nice little drawing to kind of show how it cleans up the wiring. On the left-hand side, that is a typical controller with a, um, a wall sensor with set point and override and all the wires you need and to make sure that they're terminated correctly on the, on the spider. And uh, a CO2 sensor there shown and a couple of outdoor air temperature and uh, uh, humidity um, sensors, and then a damper actuator. So it's showing you all the wires that you got to connect to your to your spider. And then the lower right-hand side shows uh, how much cleaner it is um, if you use silk. So um, we're showing a TR40 series uh, wall sensor, that guy with the LCD on it, and then two wires going over to your outside and return enthalpy sensors in those same two wires daisy chaining over to the actuator. You'll notice, <laughs> excuse me, you'll notice that that actuator still requires 24 volts, though, separate. Um, to power an actuator, we need a little bit more um, current than is available via that silk bus. And there's a, a nice uh, snip from our silk um, document that shows the various actuators uh, were listed in the spider controllers that have silk. Um, our JD economizer actually um, has silk as well, and then our I/O modules and our wall modules. Um, okay, moving to Striker. So the Striker, that's that configurable guy, application-specific controller, if you will. Um, we have a VAV Striker. Um, it can, uh, you know, you can get it with or without an actuator. You can do humidity and CO2 control. 
uh, even though it is configurable, we've added that to the configuration capabilities. And then we have a constant volume air handling unit striker, CVAHU striker, um, fits many AHU uh, and rooftop unit applications. Um, you can configure it uh, for a VFD. Um, you can't get it with those relay outputs. And again, um, humidity, CO2, and demand control ventilation um, capabilities with the configuration. So it's pretty, it's pretty powerful. Uh, um, and uh, you know, a lot of people will tell you it, it takes less time to uh, to to set up. And in addition, um, there's no downloading. You just you just drive the configuration into the controller. So you're not downloading a whole program into the controller. So it it takes uh, less time in the field to uh, configure these guys. We have again LAN and backnet models available. And that configuration wizard inside the web's workbench, um, that uh, configuration wizard can be installed on uh, any brand of workbench, by the way. It's something we've done um, so that we can try to get uh, more controllers out into the marketplace, even though someone might want to use a uh, web's workbench. If they've got a third party out there, a uh, third party system, and they like the strikers, they can put those strikers and the wizard in the inside their workbench and install them. Um, well, kind of mentioned that earlier, striker controllers reduce installation time. Um, and so uh, that's, that's kind of the key feature there, I think. Um, one of our wall modules, just a point, the, the TR40 series does not, is not compatible with the striker only the TR-71 and the 75. And TR-40 series was that uh, white LCD type screen. The TR-71s and 75s are the green ones. Um, highly configurable, um, accepts those. We call those modules, those wall modules, uh, those silk wall modules, ZOs. Um, so this, you know it's configurable with that. You've got those two accessory loops as well. So in the configuration, you can, uh, you can set up accessory loops to do something other than just the configure the standard configuration. Um, I've had people say, "Well, you know, I, I use that where I've got a, maybe a VAV box near a entrance to a building, and I've got a little uh, cabinet heater in the vestibule. Uh, I can put a, 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 a ZO, a silk sensor, in that vestibule and control that unit heater from the same VAV." control striker um, pretty easily. So that's kind of cool. Uh, it's got a real time clock, so you don't necessarily have to tie it into a, uh, a building automation system. They can be standalone. Um, and there you go. It can be used in the Web 8000s through the old uh, Web 3000s. I'm sorry, Web 300s. Uh, so striker VAV versus spider VAV. So the striker with that application is a little bit quicker to configure and, and uh, download, um, but you are limited in your programmability. Um, Landmark certified LNS compatibility, kind of self-explanatory there. Um, the striker controller IO, kind of like those charts that I showed before. Um, now you'll notice the part number is very similar, CUL or CVL. So you can get the VAV box with or without an actuator, AS or NS, and then the constant volume unit is the CUL. Um, the BACnet striker, um, we don't have the constant volume um, uh, product in the BACnet line, um, and that what is what will lead us to the uh, to the BACnet stat. Uh, we feel like that fits that uh, C, uh, so the unitary application. So on the back net side, you just have the two VAV models. And again, part numbers, you know, looks like the other one, right? But instead of P, P is for the spider, C is for the striker because it's configurable. And the rest of the part numbering system is exactly the same. Uh, just a little, a little, a snapshot of the uh, configuration tool. Um, and I guess I should update this slide because it's now compatible with uh, 4.7, Niagara 4.7. So 
um, you can see that the the configuration tool was available through uh, from webs 3.4 through uh, 4.7 now from AX to N4 um, and uh, that's just kind of a, a snapshot of what you see on the screen the configuration tool and you'll notice that there's drop downs there and you just kind of select what you've got and uh, away you go you set your K factor if it's a VAV box etc cetera, etc cetera. so steps you right through the configuration you don't have to go into wire sheets uh wall modules so those that that kind of that kind of ends the uh controllers although i will uh bring the backnet stat uh in a talk to the backnet stat in a minute but um i thought it makes sense to throw the wall modules in here so you have kind of the oldest old school you know we call them our tr 20 series which is you know sensor only sensor with set point override the whole nine yards you can get them with or without humidity and then we move to our a tr40 series which uh again that zeo terminology we like to use so zeo light um and again i know there it's it's spiders only not the strikers a little bit less costly on the on the tr40 series than the tr70 series uh you can get them again with without display temp humidity co2 um, and that's kind of nice because they can sit on that two wire silk bus in just two wires and if uh, a customer says well wait a minute i need temperature and humidity on that one i can just switch out the sensor and uh and just reconfigure the controller so it's temperature reading temperature and humidity and away you go it's got a nice little display there and then our tr70 series we have a, a few different models in our tr70 series um and uh, uh you can get them with or without scheduling um standalone um so if you wanted scheduling to be embedded in your controller and uh and i'm not connected to a building automation system then uh, i get the tr75 that has scheduling capabilities and away you go the display kit is is customizable as well which is kind of nice the tr40 not customizable uh, uh tr so fully customizable display okay back net thermostat so this kind of takes the place of the uh constant volume uh controller in our back net uh portfolio uh temperature and humidity sensor uh, you notice that it looks a lot like our uh thermostats uh, some end users really like that um, compatible with uh, a wireless occupancy kit, which is kind of cool. So I can configure it um, with that same striker wizard. I can configure this guy as well. It's got a touch screen display. Um, so I can, I can configure my, um, this thing right, right on the screen. I don't necessarily need workbench. Um, uh, it takes a, probably a little bit more time but uh, you can give it to a field technician and uh, in the documentation and he can walk through and configure the configure it right there on the screen. It's got a built in time clock. So uh, we did that. So there can be standalone. Um, the space temp sensors built in, um, but it is an uh, back then MSTP device. Um, and it's got a capacitor backup that uh, uh, maintains the clock if you lose power. Um, there are 19 configurable applications in this guy. So uh, uh, the typical applications are fan coil units, rooftop units, or heat pumps. Um, fully functional controller that seamlessly integrates with building automation systems. Sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Uh, so there's the IO. Um, I think I get into the part number here, a similar kind of a deal. Uh, but it has three universal inputs, got uh, two relay outputs, and has two tr true analog outputs. Um, so that's kind of nice. And again, standalone or integrated. Um, a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, tables from the documentation, um, and this shows you the four-pipe uh, four fan coil application. And what this is showing you is you just go along and um, when you're looking at a project and say, okay, what do I need here for the fan, for example? Is it on off or, or uh, VFD or three speed? 
Um, and then cooling and heating valves, do I want them to be floating? Do I want them to be two position or do I want them to be true analog? Um, and then do I have an electric auxiliary electric heater? Am I doing uh, economizer? And if I'm doing an economizer, do I want it to be analog or do I want it to be floating? So if I want economizer to be floating, I can do analog zero to 10 volt on the heating and cooling valves. And then uh, what's your space uh, sensor capability and outside air uh, capability are, um, et cetera. So a nice little chart, you figure out what you need and then you say, okay, I need application, whatever. I need application seven. Uh, same thing for now a two pipe fan coil. Um, and it's same kind of chart, not gonna walk you through it. It's in our literature, easy to grab. And then the uh, heat pump and uh, and air con we call it air conditioning. It's really a rooftop unit application. So you just grab the document, you decide what you got, and uh, can I meet it with the configuration? Okay, um, away I go. With that, I'm going to move to our um, LCBS Connect solution. Um, LCBS stands for Light Commercial Building System. Um, and uh, it's a, an offering we released, uh, geez, two to three, year, two years ago now, um, for the uh, for the market that we're finding uh, uh, more and more people want analytics, uh, more and more people want uh, access to the cloud via a smartphone or tablet or computer, and uh, so we uh, we looked at the market and said uh, we think there might be a little bit of a hole out there in the market, so. Uh, so we released this product. Um, who's it intended for? Really the service mechanical contractors, the non-controls integrators, the guys who uh, who are not doing Niagara, really. Um, and end users um, who might have uh, multi-site um, constant volume type applications. Um, I think we have a slide in here um, that, that kind of hits some of the some of the typical applications, school, uh, uh, churches, uh, banks, um, things like that, um, gas stations, C stores, those kind of things. Um, some pretty, a pretty powerful little controller here. It conforms to um, Title 24 and IECC requirements. Uh, very quick con uh, configuration. Uh, configure it from the from the stat, if you will, from the space sensor. Um, very easy to to configure. Um, anybody, any any service technician who has configured a programmable thermostat can walk right through this thing and, and configure this. Uh, but you can get much more data out of this controller. And we have built-in analytics in the cloud that there is no charge for um, that detect anomalies before they can then they before they become problems. Um, it's a data-rich environment. Uh, you get alerts. We like to call them alerts in this uh, application rather than alarms. Um, password protected as well. There's a shot of the uh, screen that you see. So you, you log into a website. It's not an app. We chose not to make it an app because apps have to be updated. So you log into the website, whether it's on a, a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone, and uh, you have access to your system. Um, there's a cute little system architecture. Um, it is a, uh, so let's start upper left. So you have one gateway per site. Um, you can connect up to 30 of our controllers onto that gateway. Um, again, you do not need a laptop or a computer to configure this entire system. Um, we think that that's a, a nice, a, a very important feature. Um, so you don't need an expensive programmer to set this system up. Um, the uh, communication between the controllers, you, you do have to run wire between the controllers and it is, uh, it is LAN communication. We selected LAN because um, LAN is a polarity insensitive communication. So it's two wires and you don't have to get, you know, the plus wire on one controller to land on the plus wire on the other controller, which you do um, with BACnet. 
So we tried to make it as simple as possible. So two wire polarity insensitive communication between all the controllers to the gateway. A nice little slide to say, hey, if I have an existing site that has a thermostat controlling a rooftop unit, a pretty easy replacement. I take the thermostat off the wall and usually there's gonna be five wires there. Um, our wall module, we call it the TS120, is a silk device, like I mentioned earlier. So it only requires two wires. So I take the thermostat off the wall. I grab two of the wires, whichever two I wanna select. I connect them to the, uh, to the wall module and put the wall module back on the wall. I go up to the rooftop unit. I install the, uh, you'll notice that looks like a striker. It is a striker, but it's got different firmware than the regular strikers we talked about earlier. Uh, I put the, I put the uh, controller uh, up there in the rooftop unit. I land those same two wires that I connected to the wall module onto the soak bus on the controller. And now I control, I, I um, wire the controller to the heating stages and the cooling stages. But now I have a lot more power. The thermostat can only control the, the heating and cooling and maybe enable or disable the economizer, whereas the LCBS Connect controller is a full controller. So now I can control the economizer with that controller. And the beauty of that is um, it allows me to now remotely know where my economizer is what position it's in, if it's working properly. We have analytics that tell you if it's not working properly. Um, they'll tell you if you're economizing when you shouldn't or you're not economizing when you should. Uh, you simply can't tell that with a thermostat. Um, so we've located some of the, the devices. Um, that, that LCBS Connect controller is a 6438. So that makes sense when you, when you um, go back to the part number uh, conventions. So it's got six inputs, uh, four digital inputs, six universal inputs, four digital inputs, three analog outputs, and eight uh, relay outputs. Um, so that means I can do things like what we're showing here. I can bring an outside air sensor in, I can bring a mixed air sensor in, I can re bring a return air sensor in, I can bring a discharge air sensor in, um, I have the wall module, um, I can monitor my fan with current sensors. I can monitor my, my compressor with a current sensor. Um, I can monitor my hot gas bypass. Um, I can also put a differential pressure switch or a transducer across the filter and set that point up to, to give me an alert when it gets dirty. And now I'm notified that, hey, it's time to go out and change the filters. I can also set an alert on the fan. Uh, status or fan output, and after a thousand hours, give me a word that says it's time to go service this uh, the fan. Uh, check the belts, grease the bearings, and do that work. So I can get service alerts out of this thing. You'll notice in the right hand corner, lower right hand corner, I also show um, remote space sensors. I can put up to four of those TR40, the blank TR40s, on that silk bus. So uh, if I have a large space with a large rooftop unit uh, feeding a large area, and I want a couple of space sensors. I can put the TS120 in there, and I can also put one or two or three or four other space sensors around in the space and just uh, wire them, use two wires back to that TS120 um, to get uh, averaging if I so desire. I can also set that up. I have five different configurations. I can do the warmest sensor brings on cooling. The coolest sensor brings on heating, or I can average all of them. I have a lot of flexibility. So that's kind of a, a summary. Um, you've got a lot of ability. It's, a, it's affordable um, and uh, gives you some opportunity. Simple to install. That's intuitive. It's very competitively priced. Um, I like to I like to mention that uh, the third bullet from the bottom. It's a small building automation system at a fraction of the cost. Um, also, the fifth bullet from the bottom: analytics detect system anomalies before they become problems. Um, those analytics are built into our cloud, 
So any controller you put in and connect to the cloud has access to the analytics. These are, uh, we released in February of 2018, these analytics. It's just to give you an idea of some of the analytics that are out there. Um, um, if you notice about halfway down um, that you've got economizing when it should not, or the damper is not modulating, uh, it's not economizing when it should. Um, excessive equipment over cycling, that's near the bottom there. Uh, frequent discharge, air loss of control. So, I mean, you've got a lot of analytics just built into this thing that'll that'll give you an alert. And by the way, you can configure the message that the technician gets. Uh, it's it's basically you can write in there whatever you want. And uh, in May of 2018, um, we came up with some more um, updates to the software. And by the way, when an update occurs, there's no, you don't have to re-download anything. Um, the up, update gets pushed to the cloud and, uh, and it's done. So there's no going back out to the job site and reconfiguring anything. It just, it just happens. Um, we added some, uh, there is one accessory loop in this controller, not two, just one. But uh, that's that's kind of nice. Um, you'll notice we added the hot gas uh, bypass um, uh, sensor input capability. Um, prior to these updates, uh, we could not share outdoor temperature and humidity. Now you can. So uh, you only need one outside air temperature and or temperature and humidity sensor on your system. And then you can share it to all the other controllers. And you can also do a trend uh, view. So uh, all of the points are in the cloud and uh, and are there. And uh, you can now set up 10 points, up to 10 points to trend. So that at any time you can log into the system and go to your trend view and see the status of those specific points that you wanted to watch. Um, we can get more detailed because uh, when an alert happens, uh, uh, you get a really nice screen that shows 24, the 23 hours before the alert happened for all of the points and then one hour after the alert happened. So you can analyze what happened. <laughs> we don't have zoning yet, but uh, it's coming. We're targeting the end of this year to have zoning. There's the value proposition. It's affordable, 24-7 analytics and monitoring, easy to install, install, <coughs> programmer's not required. You got the analytics that save energy, save money, identify and fix problems immediately. You got remote access to all connected sites from one website. So if an end user has multiple sites, they log in and they can see, they get a list of all their sites and then they can dive deeper into it. Um, knowledge is power. Um, it's a powerful co controller, much more control than a thermostat. You can do economizer, you can, do, you can actually control a fan VFD. You can even do lighting control if you so desired. So it's really nice for, for things like uh, retail applications. Uh, we also have applications with, uh, with gas station type um, locations because they have freezers and refrigerators and they like to monitor those. So if any time any one of those goes down, you know, three o'clock on a Sunday night, you get an alert, uh, freezers down and uh, you respond immediately and, and fix that before you lose all the product that's in that freezer. Let's move to the new BAS architecture and talk about IP controllers. So uh, what we've got here, um, I'm showing on the left-hand side the, the existing architecture, um, but now I'm going to our, uh, our new uh, series of uh, Cyper controllers, as we like to call them, Cyper controller IP. That's the CIP, the Cyper series. So we've got a, we've got three different models. We've got this Cyper 10 along the bottom there. That is a tritium product that uh, any tritium manufacturer will have access to. Uh, um, Honeywell released this uh, last week. So uh, Cyper model 10, um, 10 points expandable to 44 points with one of the old IO34 modules I can use. Um, uh, the Cyper model 50 right hand side, that plant controller, uh, that can go up to 2,500 points. Um, that is has been released for 
uh, since early January. Um, we have several applications where those are, are installed. Uh, that is has the same exact horsepower as the Jace, uh, but it has 26 onboard I.O. out of the box uh, and expandable with I.O. modules up to, like I said, 2,500 points. Um, the Cyper product family, I think the there's a couple of big, big uh, differentiators in our Cyper product line. Every one of those Cyper controllers is embedded with Niagara as the programming tool. Uh, and that Niagara ha has an open Nix statement. So uh, we have been asked by large end users, especially, um, that they want an open product. And uh, we're, we're providing an open product. There is, so in other words, I, uh, the programming tool for our our Cyper controllers is Niagara. There's over 20,000 Niagara certified N4 certified uh, people across uh, the world. Um, not all of those are Honeywell Web's partners. Um, those people can program this controller, no problem. Um, so that, that's the uh, that's that's the I, I think one of the largest uh, biggest features for the product is uh, I don't need a, a proprietary programming tool. Uh, the programming tool is embedded in it. And uh, if you're familiar with Niagara, you know that there is no download required with Niagara programming. Um, it's just a feature of the Niagara um, workbench, the Niagara architecture. So. Uh, that means that if I have a, a program running uh, a critical environment air handling unit, for example, uh, in an OR, and I realize I need to make a program change, I can I can connect onto the network, uh, get into that controller, and uh, make a program modification, and uh, the unit continues running uh, while I'm making the program change. And when the program change is done, it's live and active. So there's no uh, there's no uh, program change. Now I got to download the controller. Uh, if you're not aware of that, uh, that, that means that uh, when I download a controller, the processor stops because it's loading a new program. And uh, in most instances, that means that the, uh, that the program uh, shuts down. And uh, a lot of times that will shut down your equipment while the controller is downloading the new program. We don't have that problem with our new Cypers. Pretty big feature. The last product is uh, the middle guy, either the Cyper Model 30. We are uh, about ready to release this product in June. Um, the biggest feature of uh, the Cyper Model 30 is uh, that uh, it is included with a uh, four port, one gigabit switch on it. Um, you'll notice that we're showing that the IP network is daisy chained, uh, both in the Cyper 10 and the 30. And in fact, the Cyper Model 50 can daisy chain as well. I just ran out of space in this slide. So there's two ports in the Cyper Model 50 as well. Um, so you can daisy chain these guys. So um, the other feature that we included uh, with our Cyper family is a rapid spanning tree protocol. Um, that is uh, uh, 802.1W. That is a IT um, thing, an IT feature, and it's embedded in all these controllers. And what that means is the reason we're showing the network as daisy chaining and coming back to the managed switch is that um, what Rapid Spanning Tree Protocol allows you to do is if you disconnect uh, one of the CAT6 cables in any one of those controllers, uh, the communication is self-healing, and so uh, the, the the server will talk to the controllers via whichever path is available, and it detects that open communication path and um, automatically responds and continues communicating to the controllers. Uh, that's a pretty important thing uh, for uh, large end users today. In the old architecture, if you look on the left-hand side there, you know you have a Jace, and then you have a LAN or a BACnet or a proprietary communication wired network going out to the controllers. If that network's ever cut, 
you get an alarm notifying you that I've lost communication with the controllers, but now you, you have, in fact, lost communication with the controllers and you don't know what's going on out there until you get that bus fixed. With the rapid spanning tree protocol and the IP network, um, that won't happen as long as you wire it, uh, you connect the controllers in this fashion. So that is uh, Ethernet connection between all these controllers. Uh, the other big feature about that Cypher 30 then is going back to this uh, 4.1 gigabit switch. So first of all, our, compu our controllers are talking at one gigabit. Uh, to our knowledge, uh, everyone else on the marketplace with an IP controller, including that Jace and that Cypher Model 50, by the way, are either uh, one megabit, 100, I'm sorry, 100 megabit or slower. So our Cypher Model 30s are at one gigabit. I'm 10 times faster. We did that and we put that four port switch on there so that uh, I can distribute my OT infrastructure throughout my building. And I can do things like in the middle there, connect an IP camera to that network, uh, connect a smart sensor. Uh, there's smart sensors coming into the marketplace consistently. They're all IP devices, generally speaking. So, uh, you know, I have a I have a clock in a school. Uh, it's an IP device. I don't have to run a, a clock OT infrastructure. I can plug the clock into my Cypher Model 50 in that classroom and get it onto the network. So we think that's a pretty big feature of that controller. Uh, there's the comparison for the controllers. The uh, Cypher 10 and the Cypher 30 have a 800 megahertz processor and 2 gigabyte of, of RAM, whereas the Cypher Model 50 is a 1 gigahertz processor and 4 gigabytes of RAM, just like a Jace. So the Cypher Model 50 is effectively a Jace. The Cypher 10 and 30 are small Jaces. Um, a feature that we put into the Cypher Model 30 is uh, we included a silk bus, so I can put my silk sensors, um, I can utilize my silk sensors on the Cypher 30. I cannot on the 10 and the 50. Um, there's the uh, information. Oh, I think I have one little mistake there. Cypher Model 50 comes with 100 point uh, base license, 100, not 150, so I apologize for that. Um, uh, I won't go into the specifics, uh, um, maybe just a couple of highlights, uh, the handoff autos on the Cypher Model 30. Uh, the Cypher Model 30 has uh, uh, does have expandable I.O. modules. Um, you'll notice that uh, it's expandable up to 312 points. I can put 15 I.O. modules on it. Um, another big feature is right near the bottom bullets. Uh, there is no software maintenance fee for the life of Niagara 4 for these guys. So um, different than a Jace, um, I don't I don't need to uh, charge for the software maintenance fee. It's, in, it's part of it. Um, moving on, global engineering services. Um, some of our contractors are uh, utilize our, our global engineering services uh, um, pretty extensively. Um, and uh, global engineering services can do uh, can do all kinds of things. They can uh, they can put together a submittal package for a contractor. They can put together programming for a contractor. They can put together graphics for a programmer. All or you know totally a la carte. Um, so uh, it's a nice service, a very cost effective service. Um, the contractors uh, uh, are pretty heavily loaded today um, with their work and um, people are starting to utilize global engineering services more and more um, for projects where they're they, they're just you know stressed manpower wise and they can get GS to do work for them and uh, and it very cost effectively um, so uh, that's a little that's a little advertisement for global engineering services um, Global field devices, as we like to call them. Um, I think I have the majority of our products on here. But, uh, you know, Honeywell's position is a uh, one stop shop. We can give you, we can, we've got products for a total building control automation system. And uh, everything from actuators, valves, dampers, 
variable frequency drives, commercial thermostats, um, standalone controllers. So um, I won't go into specifics about that. I will let you know. And, um, and uh, of course, Cochrane Supply uh, can find all the right products um, uh, that you might need. Just a quick slide about variable frequency drives. I like this chart because um, sometimes uh, I'll talk to an end user and they're they're not aware of the energy savings that they can get by putting a variable frequency drive on a on a fan or a pump on a motor of any type. So uh, uh, there's a there's a equation to calculate this out, but it's really interesting when you look at the chart and you say, geez, if I'm if I'm have a 10 horsepower motor out there and I slow it down to 80 percent i'm saving 49 percent of the energy um, just by slowing it down 20 percent i save almost half of the energy that's pretty amazing and this isn't <laughs> frankly it's not specific to honeywell variable frequency drives it's how v v vfds work so um pretty interesting um uh, quick thing, uh, quick, quick uh, heads up on the um, Honeywell Jade Economizer. Um, you will find this economizer in a lot of packaged rooftop units. Um, it's very, very popular economizer today, um, and uh, very powerful as well. And uh, you'll notice uh, the two sensors on the on the bottom the corner are silk. Um, I had mentioned that earlier. So uh, I'm not using any I.O. for an outside or a, or a discharge air temperature or temperature and humidity device. Uh, just a two wire connect those guys to this S bus and uh, and the JD economizer um, um, senses them and you can figure the guy up and away you go. Um, I can actually even bring in a CO2 sensor if you notice on the left hand side there. Um, and then the right hand side is showing. Um, a thermostat and, and the outputs of the jade economizer and how you would wire that in um, nice nice also uh, configuration and um, and uh, you can you can test um, your uh, actuators and whatnot uh, um, up there um, using the the built-in uh, um, tools that are in that jade economizer um, there's just our portfolio of sensors. You got everything from our from our ZO and our regular old TR40 uh, space sensors to the duct sensors. Uh, no, nothing real revolutionary here. Humidity, pressure, um, and CO2 type sensors. The whole portfolio. That's it. Um, that's all I've got. Um, Please reach out to uh, Cochrane Supply or uh, your local Honeywell rep with questions. And please visit that web website that I have listed there, uh, buildingcontrols.honeywell.com. No username or password. You can log in and get to lots and lots of information. You got videos there. You got data sheets, technical sheets, the whole nine yards. Um, so with that, uh, that ends the presentation.